Hello and welcome back here to another action-packed episode of Job. And uh, just a couple notes here before we begin so you know where we are. We are going to finish off the worksheet from Wednesday. All right, so I know you probably see Job and uh, friends uh, listed if you pulled up what the Bible said. We are going to get there. So keep that sheet handy, but we do have to finish off because we're actually at kind of a critical point. Uh, in fact, one of the major points of the entire book of Job, which is on Job, his suffering, the cause of that suffering, and what we often think the cause is, okay? Uh, in other words, we come up with reasons for it. We want an explanation. Uh, and then God's answer, okay? So we're, we're, we're right we're right there. We're going to start talking about the big issue of the book. And so if you use the Bible study from uh, Wednesday, all right, and you go down to number six here, all right, is where we left off, number six. And if you recall, Job's friends, whom he called, quote, miserable comforters, once they started talking, um, uh, they were telling him why he was suffering. And it basically was like this. You're suffering these terrible things because you have sinned and done something terrible, and so God is smiting you, you know, something like, like this. And Job, you have to figure out what you've done wrong, and we're here to help you do that. Um, <laughs> miserable comforters. Uh, anyhow, now the question is, what does Scripture actually say about this? So that takes us to number six on the Bible study page here. It says, does suffering always indicate a specific sin? And then I put in the words from Jesus, uh, from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. It's an italic print there in the Bible study. I want you to listen to what um, Jesus said, because what Job's friends were saying was actually a very common thought. And even some people still have this thought today. These bad things must be happening because I did... I don't know, I kicked a cat one day or something like this, whatever it is. Luke 13, one to five. There were some present at that time who had told him, meaning Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or the 18, on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the other who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So what Jesus talks about here are two incidents that would be like headline news at the time. All right. And one was this major scandal uh, where you had Pilate and he was, you know, the governor of the time. We hear of Pontius Pilate and the like. Um, and uh, there were Galileans, some people of the Galilee, that he had uh, put to death. And as a way of really sticking it to uh, the Jews, he had their blood mingled with their sacrifices, which would be just about as horrible thing as could possibly happen really in that time and in context okay uh sacrilegious horrible death i mean this was just scandal bad stuff but here was his point those folks well you know what's the deal were they worse than everybody else because this happened to them or there was just this accident there was a tower that fell over all right tower of Siloam. And it just so happened that it fell on 18 people and 18 people died. You know, just one of those accidents that hits the news. I mean, we know those things. We've had bridges collapse in Minnesota. You can think of all the natural disasters. Well, it must mean that those 18 people were really bad. And Jesus says in one word, no, <laughs> in both cases, no. Like these people are worse, all right? Uh, you can think of it like this, uh, going back a few years, Hurricane Katrina uh, hits the New Orleans areas, New Orleans area. Those people down in New Orleans, they're worse than us Minnesotans, all right? I mean, so they really got what they deserve. Of course, during the winter, 
they might look up here and they might say during the winter, wow, those Minnesotans, they must be big time sinners. Look what God's sending on them. It's negative 25. Uh, you know, this sort, of, this sort of thinking. And Jesus says, no. There's another verse in scripture that says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. We're all in the same boat together. Okay, None of us stand righteous before God. Not, not a single one of us. Not, oh, the things we try to say to ourselves, oh, I was confirmed, or I go to church, or whatever it may be. Um, that's not it. Or, you know, church, uh, as I like to say, it's not the good people club. Uh, church is where people who are, are sick and infected with sin go for the healing that God provides. I like to think of church as God's hospital, where we go for healing. All right, that's what it is. It's not the good people club. Uh, that's not it at all. Uh, healthy people don't check into the hospital. Uh, we go because we know that we are, are broken and we are in need. We need healing. We need forgiveness. We need all those things, and God gives us the, those gifts uh, herein. All right. So Jesus then adds this last line at the end, which is fascinating. Verse 5 of this Luke 13. He says, No. Again, that's not it. He says, But unless you repent, you too will likewise perish. And what it's saying there is that when these terrible things happen, it reminds us of something. It reminds us that this world is broken. The whole world is broken by sin. Things happen that shouldn't happen. Uh, I mean, why don't we let our, our kids uh, uh, hang out with strangers? <laughs> I mean, the person probably means well, right? Of course we don't do that because we know that person could be broken and do our child harm. Why do these disasters happen? But you have a world broken by sin, even nature itself. And so those things remind us that I'm broken by sin too. I'm part of this broken world and I need to repent. That is, always live in repentance, turning from my sin and turning to the cross of forgiveness that is Jesus Christ and finding a new start in him each and every day. Okay, Those bad things are reminders to us, reminders to us that, yeah, I'm part of this broken world. Jesus says then, repent when you see these things. These are reminders for us, okay? As tragic as it is, of course we need to have the response of compassion and helping where we can, but that's, that's something that Jesus does say to us here in this particular sermon, uh, uh, repent. Now, one other note here. I asked the question here, and this is before we go to our new Bible study. Uh, does sin always indicate a specific sin? Not always, but understand consequences, however, are real. So, uh, child um, knows that he shouldn't paint on the wall uh, at home, but decides to paint uh, his own version of a beautiful mural. <laughs> and the child is punished, uh, has to sit in a chair for a timeout, whatever it might be. Uh, for doing such a thing, has the paint taken away for a week, whatever, whatever it is. All right. And the child sits in the chair for his time out and says to himself, um, oh, man, how did this happen to me? Why is this happening? I, 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 I can't believe this. Well, no, there is a specific consequence to your sin. A child doesn't study for a test in school and then gets an F and says, how did this happen? I, I don't understand. God must be smiting me. Uh, no, this is a direct consequence of a direct action. Those things are real. There is a difference between a car crash that results of someone just hitting your car because they ran a stop sign or a car crash that occurs because you were drinking. All right. Sometimes there is a direct consequence to your action. And it's important for us to know the difference. Because if we don't understand that our actions have direct consequences sometimes, then we won't ever truly repent. That is, turn from the sin, 
find a new start in the forgiveness of Christ. Or if we blame ourselves, on the other hand, for things that we did not do. Somebody crashes into our car, okay? And we blame ourselves. A lot of times we heap unnecessary guilt upon ourselves for things that we did not do. It's very important to know the difference, and sometimes it takes a Christian friend to help us know the difference, which, of course, is what finally brings us back uh, then to, to Job. What were Job's friends saying? All right, so we're going to start here. Uh, this very, very short sheet here that I put together called Job's Friends. <laughs> I almost put friends in quotes. No, it, in all, they were friends. I mean, they came up just what they had to say. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at the first one here. We have Eliphaz the Temanite. Okay, so we're on the new page here. And Eliphaz, and, I, and I'm going to show you here just some highlights because the next you understand 30 plus chapters of Job are these guys talking. And we're not going to do these 30 chapters of Job. I'm giving you the highlights. You can read it on your own over the weekend. All right, so Eliphaz the Temanite. He posed a loaded question to Job. This is on the Bible study. This is chapter 4, verse 7 of Job. He said, Who that was innocent ever perished? Come on, Job, you can't be innocent. Let's, let's figure out what you did. With that in mind, Eliphaz, um, Eliphaz interprets Job's musing as whining. <laughs> when Job started thinking about it, he's whining because Job couldn't figure out what he had done. When he sees how massive Job's punishment is, he compares that with, I called it, the handy-dandy chart of sin to punishment ratio. So, Job's suffering horribly, so he must have done something really bad. Okay, all right. And, and uh, in short, uh, Eliphaz and Job would agree that God gives and God takes away, but I underline this. Eliphaz believes that the system corresponds to who does evil and who does good. Here's another part, verse I put in here for you, Job 22, 4 to 5. Is it for your fear of him, meaning God, that he reproves, reproves you and enters into judgment with you? Is not your evil abundant? There is no end to your iniquities. <laughs> oh, jeez. I laugh. I mean, can you imagine saying this to somebody? Uh, someone's suffering. Um, <laughs> there's no end to your iniquity. It's, it, you, you, if you don't laugh, you're going to cry at this. Miserable comforters. Um, Bildad, the Shuhite, he, he actually takes it another step. He has a little more nuanced version as well. Uh, Bildad feels the same way as Eliphaz, mainly he was sure something was wrong in Job's relationship with God, thus he actually calls for repentance with this part. If Job repented, then he would be blessed again, all right? So, so now this, is, this is really attractive thinking. Now, now this, is, this is great, and a lot of people will do this. If I pray in the certain way to God, if I conduct myself in a certain way, I can get God to do what I want. Now, why is that attractive? It gives you something. Control. It gives you control. If I do the right things, I can get God to do what I want. Now, remember the title of this Bible study, Trusting God's Plan and Not Our Own. We do not have the power to get God to do what we want. But this is where Bildad is going. And I'll tell you, this is where a lot of folks and preachers on TV, although now I guess I'm one of them. I've become a televangelist. Um, oh, that's the other great part, televangelist. If you give a certain amount of money, then God will bless you correspondingly. Okay, so you have that as well, but it's another way to control God. Um, now, by the way, if you do believe that, write checks to Reverend Paul, uh, middle initial W, dare. Don't, don't do that. Um, but you, you, you understand. It's just another form of control. And how comforting and how prideful that is as well. 
I can control God. All right, we're starting to come to the end here, but let me just read the verse here of Bildad. He's talking in Job 8, verses 6 and 7. He says, But if you seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, all right, so you've got to be good too, you've got to talk to God the right way, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf, Job, and restore you to your prosperous state. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. <laughs> oh, there it is. Um, you take a look at this whole thing and remember, Job calls them miserable comforters and God in the end gets angry because they're presenting a false picture of him. What is it that Jesus calls us to? He calls us simply in the midst of this, one of our calls is to repent and trust in him. That yeah, these things around, around me that are, are not good remind me that, that I'm broken and I need to turn to God. I go to church. It's a good thing. Uh, not because the good people are there, but because that's where I'm going to go to receive the healing that I need. Church is not a combination of good sinners or bad sinners. Church is simply those who repent of their sins and receive the forgiveness of them. That, that's simply all, all it is. Um, and that's a beautiful thing. The world isn't good sinners and bad sinners. <laughs> it's simply those who are looking to Jesus uh, to find uh, the healing that is in him and those who have not found him yet. Uh, with that being uh, uh, said here, uh, we're going to stop our Bible study for the week. I, I uh, bid you a blessed weekend in the name of our Lord. And when we come back next week, here's this is going to be great. We're going to jump all the way to chapter 38, and we're going to find then what is God's response to Job uh, and to us uh, in the midst of trouble and, and suffering. That being said, God's peace to you all.